All right, three, two, one. Hi, this is William Ramsey. Welcome to William Ramsey Investigates. On tonight's show, I have a very special guest. His name is Anthony Bennett. He is coming to us from the UK. He's a former solicitor and candidate for public office. But what we're going to talk about tonight is a book he wrote about a murder that took place uh, outside of London in Essex, in northwest uh, from downtown London. Uh, it was involving a very famous presenter at the time by the name of Michael Bar- Barrymore. And the death of the young man who died was uh, Tony Lubbock was his name. And the book they wrote is Not a White, A-W-I-G-H-T, Getting Away with Murder. And it's it was kind of a catchphrase that was used by Michael Barrymore. And I just watched an interview of Barrymore on a Piers Morgan show out of the UK called Life Story. And it talked about this murder in detail, but... Uh, Anthony is, is going to talk about the, the events, but, uh, what, what really caught my eye about this case was, was this, this tragic event of the death of a young man in pool, but how, how, uh, it resembled many of the smiley face killer cases that I've been studying for the last three years. And I can probably talk to Anthony Bennett about these cases and how this is a kind of case that fits right into that profile. So Anthony Bennett, are you there? Yes, good evening, William. Good evening. Thank you for uh, agreeing to the interview. Uh, thank you. And maybe what we can do before we get into this Michael Barrymore uh, Lubbock case is talk a little bit about your background and how you became involved in the subject. Fine. Um, I'm 71 years old now. At the time when I started helping the father, Terry Lubbock, I was 60 years old. This was 2006. And by that time, I'd retired from professional life. I was a solicitor for many years, and I was also a a political activist with the UK Independence Party. And uh, the reason I became involved in this case was simply that Terry Lubbock and Stuart Lubbock, when he was alive, lived in my hometown of Harlow in England. And for years, I'd taken an interest in the case. And... The reason why I became involved was because Michael Barrymore was on a show in this country called Celebrity Big Brother. And it's a celebrity show where um, celebrities are cooped up in a studio for a a week or house for a week. And um, the television records how they get on. I should say to you, just for your listeners, you spoke about Michael Barrymore being a well-known entertainer. His status would be roughly approximate to Oprah Winfrey in the United States. Like the biggest, or one of the biggest. He, he, was, he was the biggest star, the, the one who made the most money, the one whose TV shows were watched by the most people. So he was a mega star. And just to put you in, in the background, this murder, which we say it was, took place on the 1st of April 2001, And it took about five years before Michael Barrymore was ready to try and resume his career. And he did so by appearing on this show, Celebrity Big Brother. Now, Terry Lubbock, when he found this out, was up in arms because he hadn't got justice for his son as he saw it. And he was obviously very angry that this man was being rehabilitated when he'd never given a proper explanation for how Stewart, his son, died at these premises. So the local paper covered this story, and having lived in Harlow for many, many years and followed this case, I simply offered to help him, and so that's really how the story started. And and Barry Moore is on this show with none other than Jimmy Savile and Dennis Rodman, NBA uh, basketball player. But, yeah, we have a version of Big Brother here in the States, so... But uh, yes. Barry Moore certainly acted, certainly acted like he was involved because... The death of this young man, uh, you know, he disappeared for a year after the death on April 1st in 2001, correct? What, Barrymore, you mean? Yes, correct. Yes, um, yes he kind of went to ground. I believe he went to New Zealand for a year. Um, he was, he had a, a lover, a friend called Sean Davis, and I think the two of them went to New Zealand just to get away from all the publicity, really, and get away from having to face... Uh, justice but of course in the end uh, he had to face justice up to a degree when there was an inquest a year and a half later and he had to return to that and uh, 
Well, the inquest was uh, a very interesting affair, which uh, didn't really solve anything, but he was obviously had to be questioned on that occasion. Gotcha. And maybe what we can do is talk, what are the official version of the death of Stuart Lubbock at his house? Harlow is how far from central, kind of central London? 30 miles. 30 miles, thank you. So this is where Barrymore lived, and he was known to go out and carouse, go to bars in the area. Is that correct? Very much so, yes. Um, he lived in a place called Royden near Harlow. He often would go to the Millennium Nightclub in Harlow, which is where he met Stuart Lubbock that night. Uh, of course, he, he spent most of his time in London doing shows and uh, this kind of thing. But, uh, yes, he lived in... Uh, this mansion just outside Harlow. And that's where these events took place. Um, there were nine people that night. Um, Barrymore was one of them. There were eight others who came to his house that night. And um, we can go, if you, if you like, through the known facts of, of that evening. Perhaps just by way of background, I would say that Stuart Lovett was 33 years old at the time. He was divorced with two children. Uh, he lived with his father. His father was divorced. And he had an elder brother called Kevin. And on the night before this happened, Kevin and Stuart um, were going out um, clubbing on a Friday night, as they often would. And in fact, their father, Terry, took them down to the nightclub. And um, what we know, and is not disputed, is that during that evening, um, Michael Barrymore came up with his then lover, um, Ke uh, Jonathan Kenny, who was an estate agent, but also a drag queen from Lancashire. And uh, they'd been together for a few weeks. And that's relevant to the story as it unfolds. And uh, in the process, uh, six other people attended this gathering at Michael Barrymore's home. It's often called a party, but it was more like a gathering, really. And... Uh, the six people who joined Michael Barrymore and Jonathan Kenny were, first of all, a brother and sister from Harlow, Justin Merritt and his sister Kylie. And then there were two girls, um, Claire Jones and, uh, I think the other name, Kelly Campbell, both about 19, 20, that sort of age. Um, two local... Uh, gay people, young people from the village came along later in the evening, which may be a relevant factor. James Futters and Simon Shaw. And uh, I think that makes up the, the eight people that we're talking about who, who were there. And week. this was kind of like an after party, so it was very late in the night or early in the morning, really, around 2.30 yeah. a.m. Yeah, so yeah, they had all been correct, drinking. Correct. Right, right. correct. We, we know that... Um, there was nobody in the house until about quarter to three that evening. So they were all drinking and uh, what have you at the Millennium Club. And then <clears throat> we know that Michael Barrymore returned with the two girls and Stuart Lubbock at 2.40. They took a taxi to the home, uh, followed by uh, Jonathan Kenny, who came shortly afterwards, I think with Justin Merritt. And then... Rather later in the evening, the two young lads from the village came in at about probably four o'clock. And if I can just take you through, William, the uh, the events as far as we know them, which are undisputed until okay. about four o'clock that, that evening. Okay. Um, they all arrived at the house at different times. Um, they began drinking. We know that there was drugs available. <clears throat> Uh, we know that uh, Michael Barrymore used a substance called amyl nitrate, and uh, we know there was um, cocaine and cannabis uh, on the premises. And he's um, he's an admitted drug user at the time, correct? So oh, absolutely, oh, absolutely. He'd been he'd been arrested many times for drug use in various hotels, but mysteriously, he never seemed to get charged for those offences. So he was often arrested with drugs in his possession when he was moving around from one hotel to another and having parties, but he right. never seemed to be charged and never seemed to go to court. And this this event that happened on April 1st, 2001, was something that was not uncommon, was un, was common for Barrymore to carouse. I, and can't, 
I, I can't say what, what, what I would say broadly speaking yes because we know from neighbours that um, there were free there was the neighbours reported that there were young men entering and leaving the house at different times of the evening this was quite a regular occurrence in the village he lived on the small estate where these things would be noticed so um, uh, the, the neighbours would say that there were, were. gay orgies yeah. there regularly right. and he was and the, the interesting aspect of Barrymore is he was married to a so yeah I think so we were talking I think we were talking about um, Michael Barrymore being married. Right, so he was married till 1997, had an acrimonious divorce, came out as homosexual and took on a kind of younger gay lover, right? Yeah, um, the, uh, he, I, I think the, um, he came out sometime in the 1990s, a few years before these things happened, and uh, he came out at a gay club gotcha. in London. And um, to cut a long story short, the marriage was already in trouble but um ended soon afterwards it was clear that he was spending a lot of time with um his gay friends um i don't know if you have the same term in america but rent boys and um younger people that is you know who were paid for sex and uh, obviously the wife got fed up with this and they did divorce it's a great shame really because it was she who really made his career she looked after him, acted as his manager, and um, I'm sure she was a very nice person, but um, Michael Barrymore was into drugs, into drink, and drifted into this homosexual lifestyle. I see. So, um, getting back to the night, so there's a group of nine people at his mansion or estate in Harlow. They've yeah. been drinking, they're continuing to drink, and then what happened next? Yeah. Well, before we go a little bit further, I should tell you that, um, and this is part of the events that happened that evening, that Michael Barrymore um, split up from Johnson Kenny during the millennium that evening. And he went home that evening with Stuart Lubbock and two other people in the car, but not Jonathan Kenny. They got separated that evening. And... Um, what, as soon as Jonathan Kenny found out that Michael Barrymore disappeared, he jumped into a taxi, um, went to Barrymore's house, and entered the house absolutely furious. Um, who is this person you're with? What are you doing? Are you with me? Why have you left me? Um, he flung Barrymore's coat down on the floor, and uh, all the witnesses agree that he was very, very angry, and Barrymore had to calm him down. Now... We don't know what part either of these men played in Stuart's death. We we simply do not know that. I have to make that clear. We don't we don't know because it's it's been withheld. But it's pro quite probable that the anger of this man Jonathan Kenny uh, could have had an influence on what happened to Stuart. I see. So he might have been out of jealousy, correct? Oh, absolutely. I mean, the the accounts that we have is quite clear that he was. Um, absolutely jealous of course i mean here was michael barrymore who is known for uh picking up young men he was another young man and uh if you were his lover at the time you'd be pretty annoyed gotcha okay so, uh, i'll continue sorry yeah so um the the next significant thing that is is agreed that happened that night was that um three three men went into a jacuzzi that Michael Barrymore had on the premises um, and these three were Jonathan Kenny, Justin Merritt and Stuart Lovett, those three. And just to set the scene, uh, this is a dark day towards the end of the, um, what is it, it's night time towards the end of uh, March, end of March, um, cold outside. Um, and the temperature about 5 degrees centigrade or about 40 Fahrenheit, uh, according to the records. And outside, the jacuzzi was just outside the uh, main lounge, and beyond that was a swimming pool. And we'll come to the swimming pool, William, in a moment, but the, it's agreed by all the witnesses that these three men were given shorts by Michael Barrymore, 
uh, able to go into the jacuzzi. Drinks were brought to them. We don't know whether they were spiked or not. But we know for a fact that these three men were in the jacuzzi at round about four o'clock, um, as near as we can time it. Now, what happened to Stuart after that time is a mystery, a, really a complete mystery. So just to try and get the, the, the facts right, which are agreed, it's agreed that Stuart was in the pool with these two men uh, at about four o'clock. The next thing we know for absolutely sure is that at quarter to six, an hour and three quarters later, um, Justin Merritt telephoned the ambulance to say that there's a man drowning in the swimming pool. And what I've had to do is to try and fill in the gaps of what happened. And the most significant thing that happened, we know from all the pathologists, is that Stuart suffered a very, very violent sexual assault. And in the opinion of most of the pathologists, that sexual assault probably played a significant part in his death. And one of them said that that was the cause of death. Interesting. And there were severe um, anal severe anal injuries, correct? Very severe internal injuries, yes. Sure. Well, there's a, I mean, there's a difference between internal and, you know, anal injuries. But, you know, I think, yeah. Well, the, um, okay, the, the, uh, the pathologist said, uh, as a matter of fact, that a, a, a hard and long object must have been inserted into his anus. Yeah. And, and the internal damage was, was severe from, from that. I see. Now, so, I, I, what I can do, I think, is, is I can give you the, the accounts that the, um, the witnesses gave about what happened in the hour and three quarters. Yes, please do. And and uh, all I, all I can all I can say that is factual is that we know that between four o'clock and quarter to six that Stuart Lubbock must have been raped and murdered. And uh, I've always put that the likely time of that is around four thirty in the morning. So that's all that we can be certain about from the evidence. What the what the witnesses say is that uh, John, uh, Jonathan Kenny maintains that he left Stewart in the jacuzzi and never saw him again for the next hour and three quarters. The other witnesses will tell you that um, they that Stewart went into the swimming pool at some stage and was seen swimming in the larger swimming pool that was at Michael Barrymore's premises. I should just say, William, at this point, that uh, we know that that swimming pool was relatively new. Um, it had not been used for six months throughout the whole winter. So uh, it must have been nearly freezing cold at the time of um, on okay. this occasion. The, 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 ver the, bar the version of Barrymore and his colleagues is that the, the pool was opened up and heated up sometime during the uh, eve sometime during the evening. It's not something that I, I can agree to, um, and I, I'd like to go into that perhaps a little bit later, the reasons why we think the swimming pool was not opened at all that night. Okay. But uh, the, the witnesses will say that um, what, one of them in particular claims to have seen um, Stuart Lubbock playing in the swimming pool. Another one claimed to do so later, James Futters, but when he made his first statement, he made no reference to that. And it was only a few months later that he suddenly remembered, as it were, that he might have seen Stuart in the swimming pool. So we've only got one witness, and none of that accounts for him being in the pool, left alone for something like an hour and three quarters. The very idea that he could have been jumped in the pool shortly after four o'clock and then be swimming around and forgotten about for an hour three quarters is impossible. But there are other reasons why we say that he was never in the swimming pool. <clears throat> to summarise, the, the two girls, the 20-year-olds the who came along, would say that they were chatting in the kitchen most of the time, which may or may not be true. <clears throat> Michael Barrymore said that he was smoking cannabis in another room with 
um, James Futters and uh, Shaw, and then uh, Justin Merritt and Jonathan Kenny were, um, and the sister Kylie were around the jacuzzi. Um, but yeah, they they do not account for an hour and three quarters of time. Gotcha. But the picture they want us to believe is that they were all in separate rooms, two of them here, three of them there, another three of them there, and nobody knew what um, Stuart was doing. And uh, the claim is made that uh, he was in the pool probably for about an hour and three quarters. And of course, if that is true, uh, William, how can they account for the severe sexual injuries? If that account is true, if, if we expected to believe that Stuart was in the swimming pool, all of this time, how and when did he get his sexual injuries? Right. Well, that's a great question. How, how did he... Yeah, so they have a story. Their stories aren't consistent, though, right? So, I mean, were their stories inconsistent right from the beginning? Very much so. And perhaps it's a big good moment to go through just some of the inconsistencies. There are so many. Okay. And unfortunately, I can't remember all of them. I've got a few notes here. Uh, but this is all. This all happened uh, when I was investigating it 13 years ago. So forgive me if I can't remember them all. But um, sure. uh, for starters, three different people claim to have been the first to see the body. And um, Michael Barrymore, um, when he was interviewed uh, by the police, uh, when he was interviewed uh, on TV, and when he um, made statements in a book that he wrote on the case, which was called All White Now, which is why we call our book Not All White. Um, he maintained that he was the first to find Stuart. Um, but he also gave different accounts himself of what happened when he found. So let's just go through some of them fairly quickly. Um, Michael Barrymore said he was the first to find the body, and he says that he saw the body... This is a quote from him, floating face up at the bottom of the pool. So, floating face up at the bottom of the pool. So, he maintains that he saw Stuart at the bottom of the pool, face upwards. And he, in his book, he explains how he s stared into Stuart's eyes at the bottom of the pool. Remember, it's dark outside, yeah? Right. Um, and uh, after a few seconds, rushed back in and got help from the others. Um, if we go then to the account given by his lover, Jonathan Kenny, um, he gives this account, and this is quoting from his statement. Uh, he says, he saw he was the first to see the body, and he was floating on the surface face down. So you can probably see two or three inconsistencies there. So his, his account says, Stuart Lumbock says Justin Merritt and I sat in the jacuzzi for 20 minutes. Then Justin and I went back in the house into the master bedroom. I had tried time to dry myself, warm up and dress. Shortly afterwards, I heard a female voice shout that there was a male floating in the swimming pool. I ran outside and I found a male floating face down in the pool. So no reference to Michael Barrymore there, so you've got a clear conflict already. Then if we go to James Futters, one of the gay young people from the village who was there, uh, William, he made two statements uh, in these proceedings. In his first statement, um, he denied uh, having seen anything at all. He said that he made his way home. He didn't know his way around the place. He didn't go past the swimming pool and he just um, disappeared and saw nothing at all. When the police re-questioned him, he then said uh, this, uh, uh, it was Simon Shaw and I who discovered the body, not Michael Barrymore and not Jonathan Kenny. Hmm. So it becomes fairly clear that he's made up this story on the hoof and this is his account. Um, Michael Barrymore has always maintained that he alone discovered the body. But it was me, Simon Shaw, we were all smoking cannabis. Michael suggested that we all go out and have a jacuzzi. 
The three of us got changed together. Simon and I walked out to the jacuzzi. When Simon and I walked out, there was no one else outside. I was in front. Simon walked around the other side of the pool. Simon said, someone's down there. I looked into the swimming pool and said, no, that's someone's coat or something. He said, no, someone's down there. And he then gives an account of how he and uh, Simon Shaw uh, dived into the pool, um, pulled up Stuart Lumbick's body to the side of the pool and somehow dragged him out. So we've already got three wholly conflicting accounts. Um, and, and there are more. Um, but I think that, that possibly gives you enough to... to demonstrate, I hope, to your listeners that um, these are accounts made up. You can't, account, you can't account for that level of discrepancies. No, no way. So then what do you think, what do you and what do Terry Lubbock say happened? Well, uh, let's go back to what, what I think we know to be certain. That okay. is that he suffered a severe sexual assault, which probably killed him. And I'll come to what the pathologists say perhaps a little bit later. But uh, working from that fact onwards, um, I think we must assume the following. We can't, can't prove these specific things, but the most likely sequence of events would be this, wouldn't it? He has a serious sexual assault. They rape him, um, perhaps using an implement. He dies probably from either asphyxia or a heart attack or both they then have a problem as to what to do. And um, we know that at some stage around that time, Michael Barrymore called his manager, who lived about 15 minutes drive away. And he arrived on the premises to supervise what I would call the hoax and the drowning hoax. And in order to present Stuart's body as having just been taken out of the pool, we believe that this is what happened. Stewart was found to be dead. Michael Barrymore's manager is called. They would clean things up. They would obviously clean up Stewart. They would clean up any other sign of blood and whatever. Um, they would then, at some stage, consider that the best way of getting out of this is to fake a drowning scenario. They then dressed Stewart in a pair of shorts and at some stage, they all they needed to do to fake a drowning was this, and there are there is evidence which we can go into which supports this. Um, they would have taken him out to the edge of the swimming pool. All they then needed to do was throw a few buckets of water over him from the swimming pool, and perhaps as we know from the evidence, they may have then stuffed some water down his throat in order to um, fake a drowning. And we know this, William, because at least one of the pathologists said that although the, the case was presented as a drowning, there were not the normal signs of drowning there. He said that the signs pointed towards asphyxia rather than drowning. And one of the signs of that was that on Stuart's face and neck were some tiny pinhead blood marks called petechiae. And these, I discovered, are only associated with asphyxiation. It doesn't happen in a drowning at all. So we know from, from that physical forensic evidence that he was asphyxiated in some way and that that happened before there was any water pushed down his throat or thrown over him. So if you're trying to fake a drowning, it's logical, isn't it, that you would, if you were thinking rapidly, uh, you would think, well, how can we fake it? Right. We need to make, make his body wet. We perhaps need to stuff some water down his throat. Uh, another thing that I think they did as well um, is that they may have stuffed some alcohol down his throat as well because when he was... Um, when they tried to resuscitate him at the edge of the pool when the ambulance was called, he threw up a, a red-coloured liquid, not blood, but was found to be a um, spirit called aftershock. And um, 
it, appear, it appears that they may have also stuffed some of this down his throat in order to, first of all, try and prove that it was a drowning and also try and prove that he was drinking to excess. Right. But uh, uh, I offer that to your listeners as a hypothesis. I can't prove it, but what I can right. prove is that he suffered a sexual assault, which nobody can explain. So that is my best attempt to suggest what probably happened. Do you know if Justin Merritt or Jonathan Kenny were uh, practicing S and M uh, practitioners? Are you aware of any stories like that that they were in that kind of gay underground? Uh, what what kind of practitioners? Uh, sadomasochism, like leather, like uh... oh. I... Um, no, what, I'll tell you what we do know. We do know that Justin Merritt was a local drug dealer. Okay. And um, it's often been rumoured in the community that he was very more supplier. Oh, see. But we know that he dealt in drugs. As for Jonathan Kenny, um, we don't know anything particular about his sexual um, practices. Um, we know that he was a regular in the drag clubs in uh, Scotland, uh, sorry, in Northern England, and, and he was in Scotland for a while as well. I um, but I, I can't say there's any evidence of that. I, I don't really pretend to know exactly what goes on in gay circles, but um, there's, n there's nothing definite that I know about that, William, no. Well, the reason I ask is I did a pretty did, uh, lengthy study in deaths of young men who end up in mm -hmm. pools, and some recent ones they've actually gone through and did some pathology reports, and these guys were tortured. And the the, the death of Stuart Lovick, Lovick fits that profile of somebody either intentionally yeah. or inadvertently dying, and then a cover-up where it makes it look like a down drowning. These bodies are found in water, and there's a good, at least in the U.K., a good 50 young men that it's happened to. And so I, Stuart Lovick fits these patterns. Right. It's really incredible. I can I can comment briefly on one other case I investigated, which was not a pool death, but um, bears some similarities. Um, this was a young man aged 28 called Alex Barrack, whose mother I helped, and he um, met up with a, uh, a high-profile solicitor uh, in London who took him to his flat in North London. And very briefly... Um, the, we, we know from that case that Alex had something called a balloon head device put over his head. Does that ring a bell? No. Okay, it's some device, rather like a, an enormous balloon, which you put over the head, which deprives you of oxygen, and is supposed to increase sexual excitement. And it would appear that he died because of... Asphyxiation. Asphyxiation. Wow. So, and and certainly this solicitor was into sadomasochism. He had um, uh, various devices in his bathroom and elsewhere. Um, there was uh, handcuffs and uh, um, chains as well. Uh, so he was into sadomasochism. In, in, uh, it wasn't. It wasn't a full death, but, but right. this was a death. But it's like misadventure. It it's a death by misadventure. Yes. Yeah. Well, they have, they have these here in the States, too, mm -hmm. that are unfortunately becoming more frequent. It's not... Uh... But did, do you know if Michael Barrymore was involved in any of that type of stuff? Or was he... I mean... All we, all, all we know is he's, he was a huge consumer of alcohol, a huge consumer of um, drugs, of all kinds of drugs. Um, and that he he was very much addicted to homosexual sex. He would he would drive around London in the certain parts of London where you can pick up rent boys quite easily. His driver would know where these places were, and he would go around hunting for them. And he would take them home, perhaps take more than one home. And um, but whether there was anything in the nature of sadomasochism, I have no idea. No idea. So how did you, I mean, once this happened, you kind of campaigned for another look at the death of Stuart Lubbock, right? Sometime in 2006? Yes. Um, the, the inquest was in 2002. The, these events um, 
my my involvement in the case began in 2006 when Michael Barrymore was on Celebrity Big Brother. And uh, when I uh, first talked to Terry Lubbock and he gave me some of the papers in the case, it was fairly clear that um, all kinds of offences have been, criminal offences have been committed that night. There was the supply of uh, cannabis, there was possession of uh, cocaine, um, he was drunk and disorderly in the town. So what I did was to try and kick things off, I tried to bring a private prosecution uh, against him for these um, alleged drug and alcohol offences. And it was that really that at first began the flow of publicity in the case. We had a hearing in the Epping Magistrates Court where the judge said that um, before he could issue a summons, um, he would give Michael Barrymore's lawyers a chance to object. And uh, to cut a long story short, um, the judge decided that a summons wouldn't be issued, partly because it was several years since the... Um, uh, events occurred and he thought there was a lack of proof that there was um, drugs on the premises that night. So well, I didn't get the um, private summons on the road, but there was huge publicity which led to massive exposure on the case. All kinds of new details came out. And uh, Terry Lubbock had got possession of all the um, witness statements in the case, both those used at the inquest and those that weren't, and the ones that weren't were very interesting. And I got to see all the pathology reports, and to cut a long story short, I then compiled a dossier, a detailed dossier, um, about 80 pages long, going through all the evidence and the analysis, which is in my book. And um, again, to cut a long story short, within about three months of that, on the 1st of December 2006, the uh, police decided to hold what is called a full reinvestigation, in other words, start from scratch again. And um, so they did that investigation for the next six months and then arrested Michael Barrymore and Justin Merritt and Jonathan Kelly on the 1st of June, I think it was, 2007. And the result of that was that Michael Barrymore was questioned for 36 hours at a police station in uh, South Essex and the police released him on the grounds that there was insufficient evidence to proceed, which is a coded way of saying they've got some evidence against Michael Barrymore and the others, but not enough to um, issue charges. Okay. And so, but they were still questioning Barrymore, right? Wasn't he, uh, he, he decided, I think it, they call it a 22, he decided he was not going to provide any information to police, is that correct? Michael Barrymore was put on the witness stand and uh, he was asked to give an account of uh, the events that night. He was questioned about uh, the timing of the events. Uh, he was questioned about the swimming pool. He was questioned about um, how he found Stuart Lubbock, or said he found Stuart Lubbock. The, he, he, he gave evasive answers to those questions. He did answer some of them. When he came to the questions about drug taking, he exercised his right not to um, give evidence, which I think in America is called the Fifth Amendment. Fifth Amendment, right? right? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Right, against um, self-incrimination. We, yeah. yeah. we have the same thing over here. And uh, at an inquest, you are not compelled to answer incriminating questions. So he just said, um, my lawyer advises me to make no comment. But he, he, he did um, attend. Gotcha. And... Uh... I mean, so there you uh, wrote the book, but you also published your accounts in News of the World, correct? Yes. Um, I can't remember how it came about, but I got an inquiry from the News of the World, which is a, a newspaper that um, no longer exists you know, in this country, but um, it used to cover celebrity stories. So the News of the World was all over this case. And... Um, I got to speak to the assistant editor there, Phil, Phil Taylor, and he was very interested. And uh, I gave him an analysis of uh, the events of that night. And um, the, we published the book, 
I think in it was about July 2007 when it was finally published. But um, he serialised the, the book in the News of the World. And um, what we tried to do in, in that serialisation was really tell the story of what the official story was, what the true story probably was, and then we documented all the uh, uh, inconsistencies, some of which I've told you about, and mm. there are many others, but the... Um, it was quite quite clear to the editor of the News of the World that um, uh, our analysis was correct. In fact, he said so in his article. He, he actually said himself that uh, our evidence was convincing. Was and it? I must admit, it was it was a very grueling experience, William, because uh, I don't normally write books and I don't normally uh, do police investigations, but um, the News of the World put me through the limit to make sure that everything was accurate. In other words, every single word and sentence in that article had to be documented and proved from the witness statements and so on. So it was a very healthy exercise to be challenged in that way. But uh, uh, bearing in mind that Michael Barrymore is a very wealthy person and could easily have called in lawyers, um, they had to get the um, statement absolutely watertight. Of course, my wife was petrified that... Um, there would be a libel action. Um, but I was so sure of the facts and where the facts led. And, of course, at the inquest, um, if you look at the account of the inquest, although the inquest reached an open verdict, in other words, no clear decision, the coroner made it clear at the end of her analysis that he, uh, there was no way that any of the witnesses gave a proper explanation for Stuart suffering those sexual injuries. Each witness was asked, how do you account for these serious, serious sexual injuries? How did they happen? When did they happen? None of the witnesses could give a categorical answer. Yeah, it's incredible. I, In... I wonder, I wonder whether, if I might, with, with, with permission, move, move on to a, a crucial point about yes. the con conduct of the inquest. Yes, because, please do. Um, the inquest opened with this statement. Um... P.C. Jones was asked to give an introductory summary of what happened that night. So that's the way inquests begin. A police officer gets up and gives the inquest a summary. His first words were, Stewart was found unconscious in Michael Barrymore's swimming pool. Stuart Lubbock was found unconscious in Michael Barrymore's swimming pool. Now, as you've as you listen to me, you'll, you'll understand that we do not agree at all that that is a fact. It is a claim and not a fact. Right. And that, in my opinion, that being presented as a fact was a major reason why the inquest did not succeed. And I'll tell you why it didn't, because the five pathologists who, um, in, who gave a post-mortem and the pathology reports, there's Dr. Heath, Dr. Calder, Dr. Crane, Dr. Milroy, and Dr. Carey. They're all top pathologists in the United Kingdom. They were all told, as a matter of fact, that Stuart had been in the pool that night. And therefore, they assumed that that was a fact, and they based their conclusions on that fact, which was not a fact. So, right. as you look through the pathology reports, they're, all of the pathologists are struggling to understand how he could have drowned, how he could be found with water in his lungs. And um, so they, m most of them said that drowning must have been a partial cause of his death. So, so strongly was that embedded in the minds of the uh, inquest and in the minds of the pathologists that they couldn't move away from it except if I can just refer to my notes um, one of them Dr. Milroy um, said that he was apparently in the swimming pool apparently he said right. and uh, he, he went on to say uh, that if it can be he then said if it can be shown that he was in the pool and then he, he also said um we don't know enough about the circumstances of the um, uh, the, the lead up to the uh, finding of the, the body. So 
So he was a pathologist who perhaps more than the others said, look, um, I'm prepared to say that the, he may have been drowned, but I don't know enough. I can't be sure what happened. Um, the others did their best to cope with the, um, uh, the, the mixture of evidence. And of course, it was rather confused by two things. First of all, the pathologist had to account for him being in the water and having suffered these serious sexual injuries. And on top of all that, there were some drugs and alcohol found in Stuart's system. I, be I believe the alcohol level was twice the normal um, drink driving limit. And there was traces of a drug called ecstasy and traces of, uh, I think, cocaine as well. Yes, cocaine and ecstasy. Now, we don't know whether Stuart took drugs that night we don't know whether he took them involuntarily or there has been a claim that he had cocaine rubbed on his guns, um, which we can't prove. Um, but it looks like there was, at some stage, or even the drinks might have been spiked. You, you simply don't know. But he, clearly he took some drugs that night, one way or the other, voluntarily or not. And he probably drank quite a lot. He was a, he was a regular drinker. So the pathologist had to cope with um, evidence of asphyxia, evidence of a serious sexual assault, evidence of a heart attack, evidence of water in his lungs, and evidence of cocaine use. So what happened really, William, is this, that because of all these conflicting forensic evidence, that they couldn't make up their minds what was the exact cause of death. Do you follow me? Yes, uh-huh. They, could, they, 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 could, they couldn't pin it down to either drowning or the sexual assault. So they gave, they gave answers which were rather generalized. And um, it, because of that, the coroner possibly correctly decided that she must give an open verdict because she could not pin down the exact cause of death. Right. And an open verdict means that they just couldn't to conclusively decide what it was. Do you know who was the first person outside of the people at the estate who found his body? Was he not in the pool when somebody, when the medical people showed up? Yeah, when the medical people showed up, he was on the pool side. Gotcha. So he was supposedly out. So he only, yeah, the, there's the, only oral statements of people saying yes, he was actually correct. in the pool. Gotcha. That is the point that I've been trying to make for all this time. Just yes, only that. oral statements by the witnesses, right. yeah. So that's your thing. Was he even in the pool? He, they might have dumped him in the pool to cover up the evidence, but... And that's yeah, another I, I thing think, about the pool is that water does have a element of washing away whatever's there so you know there's another purpose if people are experienced at mm -hmm. these types of mur i mean i'm not saying these people did it before but they might be in that environment where you know these things happen throw them in the pool to, to trick the uh, investigators trick the police i must admit i since um investigating this case and others that i've been struck by the number of deaths at celebrity homes which involve somebody dying in a swimming pool yes well there was one um, in the rolling and, stones uh, it's, yeah it's, yeah. it's the story always seems to be oh well he went swimming and he had too much to drink too many drugs so he must have drowned and you do wonder yes. with there being so many at these celebrity homes you you do wonder if it, i mean is the swimming pool there sometimes perhaps as an insurance policy in case some things go wrong you know perhaps i mean yeah, it's very strange. This is this this whole case, you know, doesn't the story doesn't make sense. Do you know if um if Stuart Lubbock what well, he was a heterosexual with children, right? So why was as he far as, yes okay. he was married, he had two children, he was divorced. As far as we know, he was heterosexual, yes. Gotcha. So it w there was kind of a strange involvement too, is that he might not have been willing to really be involved in what these guys were involved in. I suspect that's very much the case. Here is a young man. He goes to the nightclub. He meets Michael Barrymore. Uh, his minders invite him to have a drink with him. Uh, he's probably starstruck. I think there's evidence that he was starstruck that night. He, um, he gets invited home. Then he witnesses this furious row between Michael Barrymore and his lover. Um, he goes and has a drink. We don't know whether he did any drugs or whether any drugs were given to him. But um, 
he had no reason up to this point to think that he would end up being the victim of a savage sexual assault. So, but the thing is this, I think you'd probably agree with me, if you get a group of people together who are regularly have gay sex, regularly drink large quantities of alcohol, regularly consume all kinds of drugs, all kinds of things will happen, would you agree? Absolutely, especially if they're you, you doing the ML predict, you, can't, you can't predict. Now, there were... We know that um, four of the males there were homosexual that night. At least four. So it's Barrymore, and Kenny, the, Merritt was a drug dealer and gay, is that well, correct? No, no. That, um, Barrymore and Kenny, and then the two boys who came in at four o'clock. Right, came in later. And uh, we, we know that there were gay orgies there. By the way, there was um, the woman who lived in the next house. Um, said that she heard screams um, coming from the property. She probably would have heard these screams somewhere outside. And it seemed to be, the screams seemed to be around about um, 5.30, 5.45, probably at the time when they were laying the body out at the side of the pool, as we believe. So, um, you know, we, we know from that that there was... Um, something very serious going on. And one of the girls, by the way, said that um, she admitted to the police that she'd been told that there had been a rape that, that mm. evening. And wasn't there a story, too, that Barrymore left the premises and returned? Was that was that ever verified? It, yes. The, it's absolutely clear that he did uh, run down to his mates in the village. He was put up for a while with his friend Simon Shaw, who had a flat in the village. The three of them ran off before the, probably around about the time the ambulance was called, I they see. ran off. So they ran off to avoid and, the ambulances being there. Sorry? So they weren't there when the ambulances showed up yeah, to correct. attend to the body. I correct. Think. Those three were not there. They left They left it to the others. And uh, we know that Michael Barrymore's manager was on the premises at the time. So no doubt his manager said, look, uh, I'll cope with it. Um, you better get out. You better get out yes yeah. and that's not that's a very common event for handlers of celebrities is they have assistants or managers who clean up problems you know it's not unusual i mean the stories are actually legion they're happening all the time with these guys as far as drugs and sex are concerned um now well, after this pretty much ruined um barry moore's career this whole scandal is that correct yes i uh um, I'm 71 and I have got very few feathers in my cap, but I would class as a feather in my cap the fact that I helped to ruin his career. Because had we not done that, had we not acted, had we not got to this dossier and, um, and presented it to Essex Police, and had there not been all the publicity, I think that he would now be back on television and doing his shows. And uh, I think, in a way, this is a, a good lesson, um, but because... Surely he brought this on himself by um, going on television. Because had he not done that, had he kept quiet a bit longer, Terry Lovett wouldn't have piped up in the way that he did. But it was too much for him. If you can imagine the father suddenly seeing this man who has um, kept this story underneath, he's suddenly appearing as a star on television and denying that he knows anything about, uh, about the case. Of course, it was a bit worse than that because when we started um, with uh, producing the dossier, um, the newspapers who were supporting him uh, ran stories that um, Stuart's injuries were caused by a hospital thermometer. Hmm. So there were there were false stories in the press, you believe, or there were planted in the press. Yeah, well, I, I, uh, Barrymore had friends in the press. He also clearly had friends in the police. We haven't really covered to the uh, covered the police's actions in this case yet, but uh, just sticking to the press, they Barrymore's team came up with two theories. One is that his serious sexual injuries were caused by a hospital thermometer, and the other was that um, uh, Stewart must have had the caused these injuries by jumping into the pool and hitting his bottom on uh, the steps to the pool. Now, that actually delayed the inquest for about nine months because 
the police had then had to go and investigate these claims. So for nine months, the they were investigating claims that uh, they had to go to the hospital, they had to find the thermometer, um, they had to uh, investigate the pool, they had to get medical evidence. Could he have jumped in the pool? Could he have hit a step? Could that count, count for his injuries? So nine months of collecting evidence, at the end of which, of course, they concluded that uh, his injuries were not caused by a thermometer, not caused by jumping in the pool and landing on the step. But it all delayed the, the case for nine months. But, William, if I may come on, please, to the, um, the actions of the police, because please they do. are crucial here. Please do. Um, the police arrived on the scene. Um, they... First of all, they didn't take statements from the witnesses at that point, which they should have done. They should have got the, the witnesses together and got an officer to interview them as soon as possible. But that was left for three or four days. Um, they then um, spoke to Michael Barrymore's manager. And it's here where I think I've got to say that I think the police were corrupt. And I'll come on in a moment to how the um, the Independent Police Complaints Commission dealt with these allegations. But we know for a fact that Michael Bowman's manager, Mike Brown, was asked to take the temperature of the swimming pool. And uh, when he did take it, the temperature was uh, 23. The temperature of the water was 23.9 degrees centigrade, or 75 Fahrenheit, which is fairly cold. It's it's well below what you get in a normal swimming pool. Um, normal swimming pool would be at least 80, 82, that kind of, that kind of temperature, I think. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the, the whole point about that is that the, the crucial claim made by Michael Barrymore was that he had opened up his swimming pool early in the evening and it had gradually warmed up. Now, I'll come in a minute to... The, the evidence for when he is supposed to have opened up this swimming pool, but you, you've got to take this into account. That that pool was um, at, at the time he, if he did that, uh, the temperature of the pool would have been near freezing point. It had, it had been unused all winter, and it's highly improbable anyway that um, anybody would have wanted to swim in those sort of conditions. A cold night. Five degrees centigrade, forty-one Fahrenheit outside, right. and the pool. The pool would need to be heated up. Now I don't know how long it takes to, to heat the pool, but it would take some time to heat it up, would it not? From near freezing point to absolutely anything like, huh? Take you at least an hour, two hours. Oh yeah, yes, yes, yes. That's right. Uh, I think probably longer than that to get. I mean, a whole pool to, to get up from what forty-one degrees Fahrenheit to eighty. Probably more than an hour, I think. At Probably least, yeah, absolutely, hour. yes. Um, so, given that, given that that would be absolutely crucial, suppose that um, we're right and the pool was not properly heated up uh, at all, the, the crucial thing would be immediately to take the temperature of the water. Now, the police did not take the temperature of the water, but they left it to Michael Barrymore's manager to take the temperature. Now, Michael Barrymore's manager says, I took the temperature and it was 23.9 degrees centigrade. How can we prove that? How can we pr prove that? Uh, please continue. Yeah, okay. okay. So, yeah. so the, the question would be, why, why on earth would you allow somebody like Michael Brown, who was clearly not an independent witness, why on earth would you allow him to do that? Surely you have then given over uh, control of uh, some of the investigation to the manager of my, uh, Michael Barrymore. And this, we, we suspect, was corrupt. M Michael Barrymore had good friends high up in the police force. Interesting. And he was and, good friends uh, with uh, Princess Diana, too. That was one of his close friends. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Oh, he had hot friends in very high places. Uh, Princess Diana used to come to his house. He used to go to her palace down in London. Yes. So, and uh, now the other thing, it, um, first, secondly, the police did not search for. They didn't conduct a proper search of the premises that evening. It was very peculiar that you'd think that there would be a meticulous search, but they basically seemed to take the drowning story as gospel. 
The other thing they did, which is really extraordinary, is that the police very soon left the premises. Uh, Stuart's body was taken to hospital, and it was found to be obviously very, very cold indeed. Um, and he was clearly dead before he arrived at the hospital. And um, what the police didn't interview witnesses, certainly not formally, didn't take any sort of statements or make any notebook entries. And they then left the premises in the care of Michael Brown. Now, this is, a, this, is a, this is potentially a crime scene, potentially, anyway, right. a crime scene. You, you, the normal procedure would be to seal it and put a police officer there while, while there were further inquiries. But no, on this occasion, they simply left Michael Brown uh, on the um, premises. Right. And um, this was one of the things, William, that we complained about to the Independent Police Complaints Commission. And uh, indeed, the, um, the Police Complaints Commission did upheld, uphold several of our complaints, one of which was about the taking of the pool temperature. That was found to be police misconduct, and the um, police officer was um, given a reprimand. Secondly, uh, that no efforts were made to search the premises, and in particular, there was a pool thermometer which they didn't seize. Um, so they didn't seize that, they left that with uh, Michael Brown. And then thirdly, obviously a major misconduct issue was leaving the premises uh, unsealed in the in the possession of a completely unindependent witness, um, namely Michael Brown. Right. So okay. really, that the way that was handled in the first 24 hours more or less helped to guarantee that some of the vital evidence uh, was lost. Right, they could, have, they could have found out where he really died. I mean, he, if he didn't die in the pool, where did the injuries take place? Was there a place in there? Yeah. Was there a bedroom? Well, we <clears> haven't <throat> got time to go into it, but there was... Um, there was there was blood and semen found on um, several uh, blankets, dried, dried blood, dried semen, um, which was investigated later, which um, seemed to show the presence of several males, but there was no blood or semen from Stuart Lubbock's sound. But um, I didn't want to go into some of those details. are unpleasant. But you can see, I think, that the way the police approached this um, guaranteed that there would be no justice for Stuart. They they, um, they didn't pick up the inconsistencies and the changes of story and the contradictions. They didn't um, handle the scene properly. They left Michael Barrymore's manager on the premises. So uh, against that background, it's it's always going to be difficult to to prove that Stuart Lubbock was murdered. But what we have been seeking is a second inquest. And what we would very much like to do, William, is we'd like to, all the pathologists to review their evidence and be told the strong possibility that Stuart was not in the pool that night. Now, if the pathologists could look at their opinion again and say, well, look, if he was never in the pool that night, surely that proves that he was definitely killed by the sexual assault. And then we will get a verdict that Stuart Lubbock was murdered and killed that night, which is what we want. Right. Well, it's also very rare for people who drowned, have studied drownings. I can't say I'm a forensic investigator, but people typically end up face down if they've actually really drowned, and they're floating. They don't fall to the bottom, you know? So of course. falling and looking face up is a on its face a sketchy story, a dodgy story at best. So there's all kinds of problems in... Uh, in preparation for this interview, I watched the Piers Morgan interview with Barry Moore, and he seemed to be very comfortable dodging questions or saying, my lawyer told me not to say anything. And he's been living in New Zealand for decade, well, a decade and a half now. I mean, he, he's pretty much... No, too... no he's, he's been back in England. Okay. Um, yeah, he's been back in England, but he hasn't been on, uh, he hasn't been on television. He, he did a, a play for a while, and he he's done one or two interviews, but that's about it. He's... Um, He's been seen, um, I mean, he's a wealthy man. He doesn't need to work, of course, but he has been back in England for the last few years. Gotcha. And, uh, I mean, now he thinks that the, the Essex police did him wrong. He's suing him for money or something like that, right? Well, I, I just cannot believe this. That You'd think in a way he would let the matter rest, but there is a case that's still not concluded where he started two years ago 
just over two years ago, to make a claim of damages against Essex Police for two and a half million pounds, and his claim was that he should never have been arrested. Wow. And and the reason he he made that claim was because his lawyers discovered a technicality that he was actually arrested by a police officer one rank below that usually authorised for um, murder investigations. Wow, okay. And the reason for that, the reason for that, William, is that the police had to arrest all three people on the same day, more or less at the same moment, obviously. Right. And right. when he when he came down to it, they didn't have a person of the senior enough rank to uh, in, uh, to arrest Barrymore. I think it had to be a detective chief inspector, and they only had a detective inspector available, something like that, something silly like that. And so the whole claim is founded on that. But I did go to court to witness uh, one of the um, trials, and the, the court has already decided that <clears throat> he, if he's entitled to damages at all, it will only be minimal damages. So um, he's likely to get technical damages, perhaps a few thousand pounds, but nothing like two and a half million pounds. But that is the reason I'm still involved in the case today, because had he not brought that case, uh, I would not have then gone on to try and get the second inquest, which I did last year. I see. Um, so uh, again, every time Michael Barrymore makes a move, of course the father gets uh, upset and angry, and he brings me up and says, look, Tony, what are we going to do? Gotcha. And, uh, yeah, it's just a terrible case of, of another young man. And he fits the profile of all of these deaths that I've uh, looked at. Stuart Lubbock, it's young. You know, good-looking guy, same thing, ends up in water. So it's a shame. Um, where, if people can reach out to contact you, Anthony, how can they do that? Well, I, I, um, from what you've said, I don't understand how my book is um, be, being sold in America because it's not me that's uh, well, authorized it. Well, it's so, actually, I don't think anybody's yeah. buying it for $483, but it is on um, I don't, it is on I don't know who's. I don't know who's putting it up at that price, but they can get it from me at uh, normal price, which is about ten pounds or what is it, twelve dollars, something like that. And um, yeah, I write to me at the email address, simple as that. I'll give it to you now: A J S for sugar, Bennett, two N's, two T's, at btinternet.com. So it's a- please receive any inquiry. A J S Bennett. B E N N E T T at yeah. BT Internet. BT Internet dot com. So it's A J S B E N N E T T at B T I N T E R N E T dot com, right? Got it. Got it. Okay, good. So people can get the book and look at all your information. I'm assuming all the, the dossier that you have is serialized in there as well. Yeah. Okay, um, great. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate the interview. Again, the name of the author is uh, Anthony Bennett, and the book is Not a White, Getting Away with Murder, about the death of Stuart Lubbock. Thank you very much, Anthony. Thank you, William. Okay. Yeah, bye-bye. Okay.